know the Lord is good, isn't he? Thank you for being here today. Furthermore, aren't we grateful for the Holy Spirit? Aren't you grateful for his presence here in the house? I've uh, <clears throat> so, so very grateful. Yesterday we were in Amarillo. We are getting ready for West Texas Worship Conference coming up in August at the Marriott in Od Odessa. And uh, every year we've been asked to go to Amarillo and do a, an event, lead worship and speak at Unity in the Community. And um, I have family in Amarillo, and, and, and our family goes along. We, you know, we've got family all over the place that, that are ministers of the gospel. As I was there yesterday and I stepped on that platform, the Lord reminded me 18 years ago, 18 years ago, I was leading worship on that platform with a group of people that had one agenda, and that was to love God and to love people. To see Jesus high and lifted up, and we began, as we just began to worship there yesterday, and as we began to lift up the praises of the Lord, I began to just think of the faithfulness of God. Can you say to me today that God's been faithful to you? Yes. He's been so good, hasn't he? Yes, he is. He's been better. <laughs> He's been better than I could have ever imagined. And you know, I think young people, you need to know this. God will do better for you than you can ever do for yourself. But you have to do it God's way. God's way, God's results. And, and um, as we've been singing these songs about what happens when we worship and what happens when we praise, it's just reminders to us that the enemy's defeated and he cannot win if he can't steal your voice, if he can't steal your worship, if he can't steal your praise. Guess what? The enemy cannot win in your life. Things change because people open their mouth and begin to worship their king because they know that, you know, uh, the world system is going to fail. So we're going to put our, we're going to put our hope, we're going to put our trust and our faith in the living God and the living God will never fail us. Amen. 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 And so as I've been, uh, I was asking the Lord after last week's message and uh, about what do you want to do? What do you want to say? And he said, Jeremy, finish up. <clears throat> you know, I'm always asking the Lord because I have uh, a bunch of notes from even last week that the Lord was saying on servant leadership that I feel like I need to prepare a whole series for that. So I'm going to finish up Exiles today. We've been in this series called Exiles talking about the return to God. There was a whole generation that compromised. There was a whole generation of, uh, of Israelites that put God in a box and they put him back in the back room. In, the, in that, compromise set in. And in compromise, the next generation walked in the curse. Now, you and I know that when you, you compromise in any area of your life, the next time that that temptation comes or the next time you have an opportunity to compromise again, it gets easier, doesn't it? Why? Because you did it the first time. And you gave way to that conscious realm, to your conscience being stirred. And now the second time it's easier. And the third time, oh, that, 
It'll be all right. Fourth time. And you find yourself down this path of compromise that led to destruction. And the destruction brought on the curse. And this is exactly what happened with the children of Israel. This is exactly with the, what happened with the Hebrew people. They had, God had brought them into the land that flows with milk and honey. God brought them into this place. They had defeated some major, major enemies. But because they didn't fully obey, say fully. fully. You know, partial obedience is still disobedience. Yes. Partial obedience is still disobedience. Parents, have you ever asked your kids to go clean their room? They put all the clothes underneath the bed. <laughs> Stuff everything in the closet. Huh? Boy, I'm speaking to somebody. <laughs> Partial obedience is still disobedience. And here the children of Israel were partially obeying. God said, Don't, there will be no other God before me. And yet the children of Israel were building up these altars of worship to these pagan gods in the high places. Oh, it won't affect us, and it did. Where have we allowed mediocrity and compromise to come into our lives? What have we done in our, what have we allowed to sear our conscience? This is what's going on. And the children of Israel are coming back to this place where they're going, one generation's compromise is the next generation's curse. And they're living in the curse. And they're like, we have to get out of the curse. We have to get out of this way of living. And Nehemiah gets a call. Have you ever got a call from the Lord to go do something? Maybe you, you had no idea you were called to do it. This is exactly what Nehemiah is doing. Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah chapter 4. You find that Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem and helps them rebuild the walls. Not only does he help them rebuild the walls of Jerusalem but he begins to restore worship and he begins to teach the people how to minister unto their father unto God you know church if there's anything I've, I've desired for you is that you come to this relationship with the Lord that nothing shakes you that you have so much word content on the inside of you that no demon in hell can shake you off your faith. That you have this word, but not only do you have access to God's word in your life, but you know how to win every battle because you know how to worship God. You know, what we're doing here is we're modeling for you how to win. How to win in life. How to hear God's voice. How to know the next, the next move for your life. You know, I've been in church, raised in it, grew up in it, Holy Ghost Pentecostal church. And I don't know the other side. All I know is what was modeled before me. Grandmas, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins. We knew how to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I mean, I didn't want to be called into the living room when it was family meeting time. And I didn't want grandma on my, you know, just in my ear saying, Jeremy, this is how you're going to do it. Raise your hands. Okay. Jeremy, just begin to thank Jesus. Just thank him for all he's done for you. 
Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for me. No, keep on. What has he done for you? Well, Jesus, you've, you've made me you made me whole. I'm going to heaven and not hell. Jeremy, go ahead. Keep on. And she, she just began to, Grandpa began to impart faith by modeling how to do it. And this is what's going on in Nehemiah's time. He's modeling for these people that have gone astray, that have suffered the effects of compromise, and God is bringing restoration to his people. Now, some would say today, what is going on? What is going on in our nation? What is going on in our world? And I'm here to tell you, God is on the throne. God cannot be silenced. God will not be silenced. And his word will go forth. Today the title of my message is Modern Day Ezra's and Nehemiah's. Modern Day Ezra's and Nehemiah's. Church, you have been in a service where you see the response from someone dealing with God. They're being confronted with some issues in their life through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is really, you know, talk, talking to them. And as they respond to this response of the Holy Spirit's move in their, their heart, they may step out to an altar call. They may begin to cry out uh, and need to make things right with God. And in this transaction of this longing to be restored and healed, God gently does what he does best. He redeems, he sets free, and he heals by his mighty power. It's beautiful as pastor to sit and watch the Holy Spirit move in the house. And I feel like, ladies and gentlemen, it's a calling upon my life. Sometimes I feel like ministry, my ministry aligns with Nehemiah's to some degree. And as pastor, many times I'm called at people's most desperate times. I do my very best to point each person to Christ, to love them, to, to be a shoulder for them to cry on. But I always want to try to help position them and posture them to receive a now word from God. How many of you know God can do better than me? Amen. Amen. I feel my job is to help create an atmosphere of joy, of freedom, of peace in the house of the Lord. Because when there's joy, there's freedom and peace, the Holy Spirit shows up and he can do what only he can do. Guess what the Holy Spirit does? He points people to Jesus. He puts such a high demand on me to make sure the standard of worship is always at a high level here. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that we put a high level on our staff. We put a high level on our ushers, our greeters. And I'm going to tell you something. Our teachers that are teaching your children right now, we are not babysitting. There is no junior Holy Ghost. The same Holy Spirit that's in this house right here, right now, is the same Holy Spirit that's being ministered to your children right now. Someone say amen. 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 Hallelujah. And we put such a high demand on that. We come in prayed up. We come in ready to serve you. And in our service to you, we're serving the Father. Nehemiah and Ezra were called in to lead and restore the people's hope and expectation. They helped restore order. They taught the people and encouraged them to have a love 
for God's holy word by worshiping him and singing songs of celebration. And that, that became the new norm. As the teaching of God's word was proclaimed and people's voices were raised to heaven, there was a great joy restored back to the Hebrew children. And it all started when Nehemiah answered the call. When Ezra said, we'll go in, we'll restore the people, we'll show them how to read their word and to worship their God. My first point this morning, when order is restored, hope arises. When order is restored, hope, is, hope arises. God's restoring you today. How is he restoring you? By bringing order to your life. My prayer for you each and every each of you and your families, is that God begins to bring things into divine order in your life. You know, when me and Tanya pray for you, we pray, Father God, remove any hindrance, any obstacle from, from our partner's lives that keeps them from hearing your word. Amen. I'm going to declare and decree something. You ready? This summer... You'll leave it going into the next season called fall in complete alignment and order. Amen. 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 I declare that over you today. God is restoring you. Tell your neighbor that. God is restoring you. Hallelujah. Turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 98. I love this psalm. Psalm David is actually, th this psalm is about what is taking place with Nehemiah and Ezra. In verse 1 it says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth, with the harp and the sound of a song, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King, let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness, and he shall judge the people and the peoples with equity. The images of creation worshiping are referencing the undeniable adoration that all creation should bring to God. For many, when they came back to God in worship, they had to learn again what it meant to fully submit to God's authority. Standing in awe of God and his wonder is to come to him ready to worship. As the exiles, the children of Israel returned from these long seasons of feeling cut out or estranged, it was critical for them to learn how to worship God again. The idea that all creation was able to celebrate God would be a good way to remind the exiles that God is still on the throne. The significance of the of this passage we just read in Psalms 98 is a feeling of confidence that in the pending judgment, instead of being fearful and uncertain, the exiles begin to feel a sense of hopefulness with what's about to come. And like every day, you and I, we live 
not out of fear of who God is and what he's going to do. No, we live out of relationship and love for him. This is what's being restored to the exiles. And there's a hopefulness. There's an expectation that's arising within the body. I want to remind you today that you and I are called to be modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's. We are called to show people what it means to read the word, understand the word, but also to show them and model what worship is. So thankful that our nation and our justices struck down abortion. Come on, we can do better than that. We may have won a battle when it comes to banning abortion, but there is still a war being waged in this nation for people's hearts. You cannot legi- you can legislate law but you cannot legislate a heart change. Church, we have to be aware of the hearts of the people around us. Church, now more than ever, we have to intercede. We have to be willing to lay down our lives for those that need us. We have to be vigilant in prayer for our nation and against the hardness of the next generation's heart. Amen. Amen. But I want to remind you of what Ezekiel said in chapter 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Thank God he knows how to help a person's heart. Church, I want you to be aware of your words. Furthermore, I want you to be aware of your actions. Do you know that there are families and individuals that come into this sanctuary that have blood-stained past? They've been hurt, they've been rejected, they've been ridiculed by family, by friends, by society, by some in the church. Our job, church, as modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's, is to always help, to always help. To help wipe the tears away. To help lift the head that lays low. And lift it up. And point their eyes and their focus back to Jesus. Here's where we are. And it's a reminder for us as we move forward as the body of Christ. There will be many people that walk into these doors full of guilt and full of shame. Guilt is feeling bad about what you've done. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. And it's our job as modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's to point them back to the king. Jesus' victory is always known by deliverance and freedom. Jesus' victory is always known by deliverance and freedom. I love what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 when he pulled the scrolls from Isaiah and began to speak. 
He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty all those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he's called us to do as modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's. And I love what he said in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, you, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. God will do it. God's called you to be modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's. And as Christ's followers, you're called to bring deliverance. As Christ's followers, you're called to set the captive free. Yeah. Well, ju Pastor, that's your job. <clears throat> I've heard that. No, it's not just my job. It's our job. Yeah. It's our job. It's our job. The new standard that was modeled to the exiles and the new standard needs to be modeled in front of you is a love for God's word and a love for his presence. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all stand to our feet. I want to implore you, I want to encourage you to always be about seeking to understand what's going on, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those that God's placed us in. The realm of influence, you know you have influence. And your influence is great. How are you influencing? As modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's, what you don't find is Nehemiah saying, it's all about me. What you don't find is Ezra saying, boy, you better get it together. You don't find these two men saying, well, what about us? I believe if you would have heard the song sing by Ezra and Nehemiah as they high-fived each other and went into their, their houses, I believe you would have heard them say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory. For the things he has done. Father, today, may you always get the glory. As modern day Ezra's and Nehemiah's, would we always be focused on pointing people to you, a love for your word, and a love for your presence. May no man get the glory, but may you always receive it. We love you so much. You're a good, good father. 
Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you, Father God, for those that have come in today heavy and weary. I pray, Father God, that you're restoring them right now. You're bringing every family and every person into complete alignment, perfect alignment. In Jesus' mighty name, we love you and we all say, amen, amen.